Rachel would like to start by um, reading something that she's written that would kind of characterize her work. And then we're going to share with you some images of the exhibition in London, um, which you will be able to see alongside being in the middle of this wonderful exhibition here in Vienna. Um, so I, I often sort of write things to just clarify sort of what, I, what I'm doing. And I wrote this actually very recently and um, but it somehow it and I was thinking about it more about sort of what's happening now with the work but actually as I was talking to Anne and Anne looked at it she said well it's actually sort of like the beginning as well so I'm just going to start with this it's just a very short piece somehow an implosion or a space that has been crushed or devastated objects that have been pushed together melded molded as if the walls have moved inwards and possibly upwards, individual objects that have been turned into one, with space in between, cast objects and real objects interspersed, linear and solid, objects and drawings combined, something like a catastrophic event, pulling and pushing in all directions. I can see it in my mind's eye, a culmination of all these things. Rachel, we're beginning um, in this presentation on the screen with images of your studio. I think everybody who knows Rachel Whiteread's work is probably more familiar with her large-scale public projects throughout the world. That's probably how she's better known. But what is incredibly important to her is working quietly on her own in the studio. And I wondered if you could begin talking a little bit about that. Yeah, I mean, I... I had a, a studio for a long time where I lived and worked in the same building and I recently ch changed that and uh, separated the two things. I now have this very quiet space that I work in and I have a situation with a, a, someone I work with for a long, long time where we make works off site. So th this studio is really my drawing studio and my thinking space and it's a very important place for me. Should we move? Um, you know, and we, when, with the Tate show, we tried to, in a way, sort of replicate the studio at, at some point with, with the kind of archival area at the beginning. And there's this um, vitrine, which we don't have in this show, which is a culmination of lots and lots of objects, found objects and made objects and things that I've picked up and bits of sketchbook. And alongside that, there were images of... Uh, photographic images of some of the more uh, sort of complex pieces that I've made that are living in a, the sort of the, their own environment. Um, so that that was really how I, how I just wanted to start sort of thinking about this lecture. A lot of people who've seen the exhibition in London, and I'm sure here, are incredibly interested to know how it all began. What were the first pieces that led to this body of work that covers many decades? Um, and these were two things that I made when I was at the Slade, so when I was doing my postgraduate course. Um, and they were made from hot water bottles and a shirt and a pillowcase and two coat hangers. And the hot water bottles were filled with water and they were second-hand hot water bottles that I'd found somewhere or other. And um, there was something very uh, sort of human about them and the, the way in which I'd sewn them into these two things, which was sort of like a dress, sort of like a woman, sort of like a man. Um, and th this was really where I first started, I th well, using hot water bottles, but using them in a way that somehow made the hot water bottle into this sort of... Um, Torso, I suppose. And it's been a bit of a light motif throughout yes, your yeah. work. Yes, uh, and I've used it as, the, as is here. There's uh, a, a vitrine with lots of different hot water bottles um, in different materials that I've used over a period of 20 odd years. Yeah. The first solo exhibition that you had in 1988 had only four works in it. One of them was one of those small hot water bottles. Um, and perhaps you can outline the other three works and how that came to so be. So the, the other three works 
uh, were shallow breath um, and mantle and closet, which the closet was the piece, the black piece. Um, and it, it, it was really, I would say, the first sculpture that I ever made. Um, and not that I think that sculpture has to be something that is three-dimensional and that you walk around, but it was really, for me, the first time that I made something that sort of stood in a space that had a kind of um, its, its own personality, in a way. Um, and it came from the idea of, as, as a child, sort of sitting inside a wardrobe and just enjoying that dark, cosy, sort of black space. And, um, and I wanted to somehow make that concrete and make that in, in the world. Um, and the, these three elements were all made from um, very cheap furniture that was sort of post-war utilitarian furniture. Um, that my grandparents had in their house, my parents had in their house, and the kind of stuff that you see on the street, um, and you, I, I took photographs of um, things that were abandoned, um, and it really was the beginnings of the language that I started using, um, which we have now, you know, and is apparent in this entire exhibition. Um, Shallow Breath was uh, a piece that was the cast of the space underneath a bed. Um, and again, it's, it's a, I've often make objects that are repeated. You know, I'll, I'll work with them time and time again, just sort of playing with materials and um, the feel of them. But this, this particular piece was called Shallow Breath. Um, and it was made very soon after my father died. Uh, and then the other piece was called Mantle, and it was cast from a dressing table. And you then began to expand your use of the casting process to include different materials? Yeah, so I was using uh, mainly plaster at the beginning. I would say initially uh, purely because it was all I could afford, um, and it was also a material that was... You know, I was always very interested in the sort of alchemy of it as a material, in the way it was powder and then it turned to liquid, then you, then it, then it became hard, then it became hot, and then you could sort of um, dismantle the mold and the thing would appear. And I loved that process. And the other processes that I've used, using rubber and metal and all sorts of other materials, are, you know, it's all a very similar process. Um, but it doesn't have that same sort of hands-on feeling that you get with plaster. Um, but a lot of these other materials, a lot of these rubbers, um, were... I got a, a few factories to invent materials for me, um, and I'd say that I wanted a material to be like the... Um, the colour of the first piss in the morning, or, you know, mm -hmm. something... So they were always sort of internal and bodily and... Um, and it was something that I was very interested in, in exploring materials in that way. Um, that particular piece on the, whatever, Left. Uh, right for them when they're looking at it, uh, it is um, cast from a, 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 an airbed. I actually made that in, when I was living in Berlin. And the, that material, which was very like bone, actually, and it was the material that was used to make skateboard wheels. And those sorts of things, I always loved that um, aspect of the, the, the fact that these materials were often used for something else, a, plaster, a dental plaster that was used for making casts of teeth, and I would make them in you know, you know, very large sizes. So yeah, I enjoyed playing with all that. And then from these domestic size objects, things that related very much to the human body, you gradually began to expand to include architectural details, fireplace, bath, sink units, and what then led you to want to expand in scale to a much larger form, yeah. an entire room? Yeah, so I, I was working at the time, and, and really I think when I made that very first show, which was the, the closet, the... Um, mantle and uh, shallow breath and the torso. These were the four elements that you would find in a room that was 
the size of Ghost, which is this piece. And, um, and all of these things were very important, the way I wanted to sort of make them. They were all, uh, but you know, to do with the size of my body and how I could physically move things, um, how I could make things on my own. Um, and, you know, it, it, when I first left, left home, those four elements would have been in a room very similar to this that I lived in as a student. So all of these things were very much, you know, it was a sort of circular thing, and I was exploring my, uh, and inventing a language. And then from, from an entire um, room in a Victorian house, you then progressed to an actual house. Um, probably your first public works that was, yeah, really brought your name to international attention. Yeah. Um, this was called House, um, and there's a, an extraordinary um, uh, body in, in the UK called Art Angel, and they came to me um, and asked me when I'd, uh, soon after I'd made a ghost release, is there anything that you want to do? And I was a very young artist, and, um, and I sort of said, yeah, actually, I want to make a house. And they went, great, we'll do it. And, uh, you know, it was an amazing act of faith and naivety on both our parts to just go, okay, let's do this. And it took, um, it took probably sort of two and a half years to do the whole thing. I was living in... Berlin at the time, um, when, when we first started thinking about it, and I was sort of travelling backwards and forwards to look at sites and things. Um, and we found this extraordinary site um, in the east end of London, and, uh, yeah, and I was able to make this, this building, which was there for, you know, as anything does, you know, when you make a building, it costs twice as much and, you know, takes twice as long and whatever. We had a very, very tight budget and the timing ended up being um, such that we'd had the site for six months or for uh, nine months, I think, and we, by the time we'd finished making it, we only had sort of three months that it could stay up and there was a particularly horrible man who'd wanted it um, uh, torn down and it was a very interesting moment in, you know, in, in art history, really, in London. And uh, it was the first really sort of public sculpt, wasn't it, that, you know, there was a, an act of parliament where they wanted it to stay up and there were people wanting it to come down. And it was a very sort of interesting debate about public art. Um, but actually, it ended up having a very short life of about three months. Um, uh, but I'm extremely proud that I made it. And, uh, yeah, you know, it's taught me a lot about what I do now. <laughs> I mean, it was a work that was intended to be a temporary public sculpture, but once you had actually constructed it, there was a huge volume of opinion that wanted it to stay up longer or permanently, oh, yeah. as well as the volume of opinion that wanted it to be knocked down. Yeah, so it was very sort of controversial. And, um, you know, I was, I mean, to put no find a point in it. I, I was sort of blew up a shitstorm and I was in the middle of it and actually it was quite unpleasant to, and very sort of stressful to be involved with it. And um, But I was very sorry to see it torn down so quickly. I never imagined that it would stay up for a long time but it, it was torn down very quickly. And you talked about that being coinciding with the time that you spent on the DAD scholarship in Berlin. A time where you also devoted much of your time to making drawings, something you've always done, but something is incredibly important to your practice. And I know you wanted yeah. to say something about your drawing. Yeah, I mean, w when I lived in Berlin, I, I'd, I'd come from having a, living in a tiny uh, apartment with my then boyfriend, now husband. Um, and we were on this, I, I went, got, in, got the DAD scholarship. And we lived in this fantastically large apartment and couldn't believe the size of it. And so I was able to have a drawing studio at home. And it, it, it really changed the way in which I worked, actually. And I'll always be very grateful for that. Um, so I'm just going to read you a little piece about drawing. Drawing is a testament to the time spent before 
and the now. I've always loved drawing, it's part of me. Like a doodle, it helps me to think, to organize my mind, to disorganize my mind. I like materials, I like painting, and I like making sculpture. I'm saying this because I essentially make no distinction between any of these practices. Drawing for me is sometimes slow, sometimes fast, sometimes thoughtful, sometimes angry, sometimes sad, sometimes hard, and sometimes soft. The simple act of picking something up from a surface and placing it upon another can sometimes be a drawing. A smudge, the catch of light on a wall, the weather, all of these things accumulate, assimilate, and eventually, slowly or quickly, can end up in a sketchbook, on a wall, or simply in the ether. Drawing is in my hands, in my breath, and in my heart. And for the exhibition here in Vienna, the drawings that you selected to be shown here are the ones that relate directly to the Holocaust Memorial. But on the screen, here are a few examples of the drawings that were shown in London. Um, and again, alongside the drawing practice, this very modest practice that you continue to develop alongside your larger scale projects. It's experimenting in different materials, different colors, with the torso hot water bottles. Um, again, a beautiful piece in the entrance to this exhibition composed of multiple um, resin casts of the underside of chairs. Resin has been an important material for you, and with this series of underside of chair casts, you introduced seriality into your work, um, something that you've returned to many times. Yes, yeah, I mean, th sorry, there, there are a number of ways in which I use seriality. One could be um, casting a bed a number of times, or a bookcase a number of times, making lots of different bookcase pieces. Um, but one thing that I have done uh, with the chairs is slightly different because I kind of see them more as kind of architectural works in a way. And um, by using the chair um, and casting it in, I think f for the piece that I made that was shown at the Tate, there were uh, 10 different types of chairs using 10 different types of resin and 10 different types of catalyst. And from that sort of combination, you could... I, I never added any colour, and that, that was something that I always... I, I mean, I do it more now, where I do add colour, but I'd always set myself these sort of rules and regulations about how I could make something. And the um, uh, one of the things was that I could never add colour to anything. And by using these different types of catalyst and, and this formula, you could change the colour. So there was, a, you know... Sort of infinite, in, infinite sort of shades of um, pinks and blues and yellows, um, and the chairs all ha had very different sort of shapes. Some were stools, or some were chairs like you're sitting on now. Some were sort of old, you know uh, antique chairs. So, but they all had this um, slightly kind of architectural feeling, like a, a building, and the way they're set out, they're sort of like a, streets, but they're also like an audience, like an empty audience. So there's all sorts of different connotations involved. Um, but, but one of the other things that um, happens with the resin works is there's there's the sort of sense of time with the casting of them because they're uh, cast in layers and they have to be cast in such a way. I had, whilst I was experimenting, I nearly set fire to my studio, you know, just doing all sorts of, you know, things with not much health and safety involved back in the day. <laughs> um, and uh, they, they were very, you know, you have this sense of time because you can see these layers and when the light comes through and there's a certain way in which the light's reflected, you can see the layers. But at that stage, colour was still something very delicate and associated with natural colours, with bodily fluids, yes, yep. um, alongside the pale plaster works you were known for. But your experimentation in the material of resin reached um, great heights when you went on to use it to make 
public works. This, for example, um, the cast of a water tower in New York. Yeah, and this, this came about, um, so there's a, a very interesting art body in um, the States uh, called the Public Art Fund. Um, and the guy who was running it at that point, a guy called Tom Eccles, um, came to visit me in London and said, you know, I really want you to come to New York and make something on the streets of New York. And after having made House, I was feeling very sort of raw and didn't really want to have something on the ground. Um, but I, you know, I went to New York and I sort of wandered around for about two weeks looking at all the different sites that I was offered. And they're, they're all very sort of famous sites in New York, outside the Rockefeller Center, or, you know, all sorts of places. And I just didn't want to do sort of what I call plop art, which is uh, putting things in places that don't necessarily, they don't necessarily belong. Um, and, so, and I started to think about what I felt about New York as a city and the fact that it's always, you know, you're always kind of looking up. And then, of course, by looking up, you then notice other things about New York and the fact that it wasn't all these sort of shiny buildings, that there were all these other things that were happening, these sort of short, hairy buildings with this, what I call the furniture of New York on them, which were the water towers. Um, and the water towers live on top of um, many, many buildings, some very modern buildings, you know, it's, and they're used now and have been used for a long, long time. Anyway, so I decided to cast a water tower in resin um, and then put it back onto the original um, metal frame, which is called a dunnage. When, and it lived like that in Soho in New York for uh, a couple of years, and it's now actually on the roof at MoMA in New York. <coughs> but at by that stage, you were beginning to be known as an artist who could handle big public projects and therefore became known for an artist who could address something as yeah, moving and as sensitive as a Holocaust memorial, um, which is your first encounter with Vienna. Yes. <laughs> um, yes, and a piece that I am extremely proud of and um, I, I'd like to say that when I did this show here, and it opened here um, whenever, a few months ago, it was the first time I'd been back to Vienna since I made it. So that might give you some sense of how complicated it was. Mm -hmm. um, I, was uh, I was determined, shall we say, that it was going to look like this, it looked like it does now. Um, I was determined it was going to stay in the square that it was made for. I was determined that I wasn't going to be, what should we say, bossed around by the politicians who wanted it somewhere else. Um, I was determined that um, I was going to give Vienna a very tough sculpture because it needed one. And, um, and I think I've done a good job and I'm very proud that it's there. <laughs> One advantage of it taking so long is that it prompted a body of related work that yes. is <laughs> <laughs> endless, in this room. endless bookshelves and tables, lots of tables I made. Lots of there were a lot of discussions, should we say, with all sorts of people. And uh, yeah, tables, yeah, ten tables or nine tables. Um, endless libraries, uh, endless bookshelves, and they were made out of pure frustration back in London, uh, trying, to, uh, trying to sort of make the thing happen. And you know, the Holocaust War took five years to make, um, and it was uh, a very hard won battle, and there's some very good people in this audience that helped a great deal to make it happen. Um, and you know, I think that, um, yeah, I, you know, it, th these things are always difficult and um, I don't think you make good public art by having an easy ride. It could have been a bit easier, but, um, you know, I think it's, it's very, very important that these things exist. And um, I was very aware of 
some of the other memorials that were in Vienna, uh, a particular one by someone called Herdlitschke, um, which I was uh, rather horrified by. And um, so, so I was really, I was determined to, um, to make this happen and it's there and I'm very proud of it. Very good. <laughs> <laughs> we want to allow time, obviously, for some um, questions from Vienna also. So I think we'll move through quite quickly um, through the rest of the public projects to a moment where colour really entered your life. Yeah, I, I, um, I have two children now. They're 17 and 13 years old, um, two boys, and... Um, when I had children, I was very, uh, you know, it's work cha it, things changed in the studio in the way in which I worked. And I really enjoyed becoming much more playful. And I had stopped a, a lot of the things that I had been making, like these staircase pieces and Room 101 that's here. And, um, uh, you know, they were they were very big sort of productions, and actually, what I really wanted to do was to just really shrink down and make some very small things. So I made a number of of works over a period of sort of two or three years, and that were much more kind of playful and using sort of domestic detritus, so the sort of rubbish of of our lives, um, to uh, create some of these other works. And I was using a resin, actually, the resin here. Um, was developed from sugar and uh, it's sadly not something that's uh, gone into sort of mass production but there was a, a plan that it would and I was one of the experimenters with it um, and I think the other one the other pink one is dented plaster again yeah. and I was using lots of boxes for for many reasons I, I, I we, we really can't sort of go through everything here but um, uh, when I made the uh, very large piece that I th you just saw um, that was at Embankment at the Tate Modern. Um, this was cast from thousands and thousands and thousands of boxes. Um, and, you know, there's a way in which I try to work using sort of an emotive start to something. Um, and this came really from a box that I, I'd found when we were clearing my mother's house out after she died. Um, and um, this really sort of started this whole thing, working with boxes, then working with boxes and making the plaster works that are in here, for example. So working on a large scale, working on a small scale simultaneously, and then this introduction of colour and different hues extended to not just the objects you found in rooms and the architectural structures, but a series of doors that began with a series of plaster doors, has, has moved on to resin doors, and a series of floors. Uh, yeah, so, so the doors, um, this, uh, yeah, so over there, um, this is called Due Porte, which is uh, the, the two Italian doors from a, a, um, an Italian uh, sort of building. Um, you know, and the doors are something that I, I like to use. You know, there's there's something about a door that I endlessly fascinates me. Whether you know, philosophically, psychologically, you know, and um, and sculpturally, um, and so it's something that I come to time and time again. In a way, they are my kind of paintings. You know, I I started as a painter. I did, studied as a painter, then as a, I did undergraduate painting degree and then postgraduate sculpture. So I, you know, I've always like this sort of uh, way of playing with um, things that go against walls and you know lean and go go on walls like the window pieces um, yeah it's, I do I do want to just say something about cabin and um, yes yeah. so yeah yeah so it, we should probably finish this presentation before we hand on to questions with this last group of outdoor large-scale works that are very different from your public sculptures in that they sit very quietly and quite hidden in the landscape. And I know there's something you'd want to read about this. Yeah. Um, so this is a piece that's, that's in New York um, and it's on a place called Governor's Island. 
um, cabin 2015, Governor's Island, New York, USA. When I was approached to make a proposal for Governor's Island in 2013, I instinctively knew I could make a work that would fit. The place in its abstract concept was perfect, a place and a work that could be harmonious in the mind's eye. The site with its relationship to the Hudson, the Statue of Liberty and the Freedom Towers, or the ghosts of the World Trade Center buildings. This was, I anticipated, the perfect place to try and make a profound work that would be sited on what was a geographical feature that had, uh, sorry, that was added to in the early 20th century when f five million cubic yards of landfill was deposited on the island using the material excavated from the Lexington Avenue subway line, or as I saw it, the geology and detritus of New York. I was thinking about Henry Thoreau's Warden's Pond and research writers such as Robert Sullivan, uh, and who wrote something called Rats and Meadowlands. My intention was to encapsulate feelings of optimism and pessimism, joy and sadness, meditation and elation. Placing an object that might represent peace and history concurrently, I wanted the work to grow into the landscape and environs, reacting over time to the weather and the planting, eventually forming a symbiotic relationship. In time, I hope my piece Cabin will feel as if it's always been there. So all of these works, uh, there's a number I've made now, um, which I call shy sculptures. And I call them shy sculptures because of, I think it's quite... Um, uh, you know, with all the sort of brutal attack that I've had over the years with things like making the Holocaust Memorial uh, House and uh, various other things, um, it was actually felt like a really good, interesting way to work would be to work in places that were really hard to get to and that the journey was as much part of the story of the piece as the piece itself. So I've now made two pieces in the Mojave Desert in California. Uh, there's one in, um, on a fjord in, um, just outside of Oslo um, in Norway. And um, there's one in the countryside in Norfolk um, in, in the UK. And there are other ones um, you know, that, I, that I'm thinking about. So it's my way of making work that is very hidden and that you really have to take time to go and see. Because I must say that I find a lot of art, you know, very instant. It's, you know, th there's so much now and I think it's just a nice way to just try and slow things down and to have a journey looking at something. Thank you so much and uh, thanks for inviting me to have this talk and I also tried with my best school English. <laughs> I prepared some questions but some of them have been already answered so um, but um, I want to start with um, um, the work you, you called a tough sculpture for Vienna because we needed it. <laughs> um, in, I know that these controversial discussions about a memorial piece for Judenplatz um, have been like hell for you, you already mentioned it, but nevertheless um, for the people here it's, the, it's a kind of their daily, everyday life, they, so it's maybe of uh, an interest for them. Um, as I know site-specific work is very important to you and, and you criticize these kind of plop uh, art that is dropped into an apparently random side of the city. So what I'm curious about is um, how did you approach the public space of Judenplatz uh, when, you, when you came here to prepare this work and, and what experience did you make? Well, I, I had, as I say, I'd lived in um, Berlin for a while, uh, for 18 months. And when I was living there, um, I had spent a lot of time, it was very soon after the war had come down, and um, I uh, spent a lot of time going to concentration camps and um, going into the East and looking at things that had happened over there and, you know, the remnants of the Berlin Wall and all of those things that were, you know, very... 
very sort of recent history. And, you know, even though we, we have all of that in London, uh, you know, not to the same degree, obviously, but there are, you know, there's, there's scarring in, in, in London, but it didn't feel the same way. So it, it was felt like I, I wanted to sort of absorb it and, and try and understand it and obviously be very affected by it. Um, and when I came back to the UK uh, and this piece, this, I, you know, there was a, I was asked to put in a proposal, um, somehow I felt that I had some understanding of what it was I would need to do. And if I hadn't have had that experience, I would not have done it, you know, and I'm absolutely clear about that. Um, because you, I think that I, I really needed to feel it, I really needed to understand it, and I would never have wanted to just try and um, do something that I didn't understand. So I came, you know, I came over here and I, and I looked at the site and and I knew the history of the site, I knew everything about it, um, and I felt that there was a way that it really could be worked on where the um, I could make this sort of library, this nameless library, um, and it was as if I was taking a room from out from one of the surrounding buildings, um, you know, roughly based on what the room size would be. Um, and then knowing the history of the synagogue that had been there um, and working with arch the architects that I worked with, you know, we developed a way of doing the whole thing together. So I don't, you know, you may not even realise, but the... the, the the top of the memorial has a, a ceiling rose, um, which you can see from when you're in the surrounding buildings, and the ceiling rose has a hole in it, and that's where, when the rain, when it rains, the, the water goes through the hole in the centre, and, um, you know, for me, that was very important, that it was sort of, there was this sort of, like, the tears coming through or something. You know, and those things which I don't think were ever really... Um, uh, discussed or whatever. Well, nothing was really discussed once it was. It was more just about trying to make it happen, um, and uh, you know the, the whole. I don't. You know, I don't know who. You know, who's been to see it. But you know, the the, the um, sort of memorial room underneath as well is incredibly important. Um, so we worked with the architects. We worked incredibly hard to make the thing work as a sort of holistic object, um, and um, yeah. I don't know if I've answered that, but... And what I'm interested in is, why did you call it a tough sculpture? What is tough about it? Well, uh, when I did, when I... Um, when I went for the interview, um, I was... I had for a moment, I didn't for a moment think I was going to win this because there was a very high caliber of people that were um, putting in their proposals. And um, when I was, when I went to do my thing, and I'd never been to what you call a jury because I'm an artist, I'm not an architect, and arch it's something that architects do a lot where you go to a jury, uh, but I did never so I was absolutely horrified when I went into this room and I had and I was then it's like there were all these people just going what is it you know where and being really and I was like oh god it, you know and um and someone said you know it's so tough it looks like a bunker you know and I said really knowing full well that it looked like a bunker you know I'd been I'd done all my research around you know, war, war memorials in America. I'd been along the Atlantic Wall. I'd looked at the bunkers that were there. I'd done an awful lot of research all around Europe. And I knew full well what I was doing. And I wanted to make something that looked like a bunker that was impenetrable, that was really tough. But I pretended that I didn't know what they were talking about and said, what do you mean a bunker? I don't know what you mean by that. And... Um, and sort of somehow managed to convince, because there were some very good people in the room um, who, who could see that the piece was, was very tough. It wasn't in any way sort of figurative or sentimental or, you know, that it was doing, it was doing what it was doing. And so, there, so these people managed to sort of push it through. Unfortunately, one of the things that happened, which I, st I, I do feel bad about, but it was, um, um, 
you know, it's an interesting story, um, was that there was someone who, Simon Wiesenthal was, was on the committee, and um, he was very, uh, very unclear about my sculpture. He wasn't happy about it at all. He wanted something figurative. And, um, and he was, he was, it was suggested to him that um, I might be Jewish because of my name, mm -hmm. Rachel. And he just needed this suggestion to think, oh, okay, yeah, that's good. I'm, I'm. <laughs> so he was sort of happy to hear that I was Jewish, but I don't, this is totally unbeknown to me. And when I, um, well, after the evenings, um, oh, after the interview and everything, and I, it had gone so badly, I just thought this is just, this nothing, you know, this isn't going to happen. So I went out and actually got very drunk with one of the two of the other people on the thing. And and then I got on the plane the next morning. And um, as I got on the plane, I was then pulled off the plane and told that you have to go back to the city of Vienna. And I was like, what? Oh God, no! What's what's happening? And they said, you've, you know, you've, you know, you won. <laughs> and I was like, oh, God, you know, with a very sore head, was trying to sort of get my head around what was going on. And Simon Wiesenthal was very proud that he had his young Jewess there. And, uh, you know, and in front of a whole bank of um, TV people, he was told that I wasn't... Well, I, I had to say, because they said, oh, you're Jewish, aren't you? You're Jewish. And I said, no, I'm not Jewish. And I had, for a second, tried to pretend that I was. And he had his arm around me, as this very, very proud, and then his arm fell to his side. And he didn't speak to me for the rest of the time and never spoke to me again, which I'm very sad about, actually, but it's, you know... Yeah. Sounds like a heavy encounter. Yes, it was very yeah. complex. Um, will you... Will you return tomorrow to Judenplatz? Will you have a look at your uh, sculpture? Well, I, I, yeah, I've been, I mean, I've been back a number of times since I've and been And what, what is, what is the, um, when you enter the place now, uh, the Judenplatz, with your sculpture, what is your feelings? Have they changed or...? No, actually, not at all. Um, I, there's a couple of repairs that could be done, I must say, if anyone's in here who'd like to make that happen. Um, <laughs> so, um, there's a couple of municipal vehicles, I think, have gone into the corners of the base. Uh, no, I, f I feel very, very proud of it, and it's doing its job. And I must say, I'm also very proud of the fact, because the interior of the work, or actually not in the interior, they had to get moved so that they weathered at the same time, but there's a, a lot of books cast somewhere and um, they we, because we thought that the piece was would get because there was a, so much antagonism towards it and we thought that there would be a lot of vandalism actually and thankfully there hasn't been um, so uh, it's still in a pretty good state yeah another question for Anne Gallagher <laughs> um, this fusing of objects of the everyday with universal experiences with emotions of loss and desire of grief and mourning and within the work of Rachel Whiteread. Um, is it therefore you began to mesmerize for her work or what was your first um, contact? I, I mean, I guess I got to know Rachel as a person at the same time I was, as I was getting to know her work. And I think... No, there's something very contradictory about Rachel's work because it is very tough. It's very, very heavy. Almost every single piece in this room, even the smaller pieces, you can't imagine that a, a small woman like Rachel could make them. Um, but at the same time, they have a, such a poignancy and a sense of, um, yeah, making you stop and think, making you think about every surface in each of the sculptures and how it relates to lives. And I th it makes me think that only a woman could have made this work, however heavy they are. Um, but it's... Woman can do everything. Of course. <laughs> but it also, as I got to know Rachel as a person, at the same time as I have got to know her work, um, the two have become very intertwined for me. We've known each other for a very long time. <laughs> And um, 
when you prepared the show for the t for the Tate, what what aspect was the most important for you? What was your main idea? I think it's very, perhaps very different when you show after decades and decades in your hometown to actually show the range of your work over a you know, almost 30 year period to make it clear exactly what the project is. And that's kind of what I felt we had to do um, and not have Rachel sort of personified as the person who made House in London, the person who made the Holocaust Memorial in Vienna, and the person who made a water tower in New York, that the, the breadth of her practice was much, much more than all that. Um, and although those are fantastic works and really important and reached huge audiences, there is so much more that is part of it. And just to show that much more intimate work as well, um, that was the challenge, and obviously space is a challenge for any sculptures exhibition, and to make an exhibition that you can negotiate and experience and walk around and see every angle that the artist intended you, in the way you, the artist intended you to see it. So I guess, yeah, that was the challenge. And as it was for Harold and the team here, um, and as it will be in Washington when it tours there next. Um, as I saw the cover of the catalogue of the Tate exhibition, I was quite astonished because here on the cover there's one of the resin doors and with the name of the artist with, um, on top of it. And for the English uh, catalogue there is, you for forego an any image of a uh, work of Rachel Whitefield. And uh, instead of a piece of work, you can see a sheet of scaled paper, um, same paper the artist uh, you're using for drawings and um, construction designs. Um, why that? We actually had two catalogues in English. So we had one with the same image of the double doors as a paperback edition. And then for the hardback edition, when we were working with the designer, Rachel very much wanted to use this graph paper that's almost, not always, but very often the paper she uses to make her drawings. Um, or maybe you want to mention, Rachel, why, you've, why you were happy to have one cover that was entirely materials-based rather than representational. Um, I think... It was something to do with um, the. It, it was sort of to do with the texture of the book, actually, and the fact that it's uh, you know a hardback book, and um, uh, you know I love books, and um, yeah, there's something. There, there was something about being able to make something in that way that was just a very, very you know, and then using the um, uh, what do you call it the frontispiece, the what do you call it the pages in the where we use the papier mache. Um, oh yes, yes the, the in, in the inside the cover. Inside, yeah, yeah. So it was about sort of making the sort of materiality of, of the things that I use. Actually, um, yeah, I, you know, it's something I just I like making books, and it's a lot, you know, if you can play with these things, then it's it's good to be able to. Okay. Um, we were already you were already talking about. Um, the essence of your um, of your work and in a lot of your sculptures, you are casting objects and therefore make the space that they w that the objects once occupied visible. Things are not things that are not able to grasp or to touch become a physical body. Um, sometimes an enormous volume. Uh, you make the void, the empty space, perceptible. Um, can you please exaggerate on how this idea was born? You already mentioned that was was first piece, but what was the idea? What was what happened in your life to to get to this idea um, of transforming and to make something visible that is ex in, in, not in visible, existed? Yeah. Um, 
I think, you know, I'd made those first few works, the shallow breath and um, closet and mantle. And w when I, I think it really, the, the sort of eureka moment in a way was when I made Ghost. Um, and I, so I'd been working in this small room for months and, um, you know, mainly on my own. And then I came back to the studio with all these pieces, all these pieces of um, cast material. And I, you know, even though I'd, I'd sort of knew what I'd done, I didn't really know what I'd done because I'd have to, I'd, every piece that I'd made, I, I sort of cut and put back onto the wall. So I was only ever on the interior of the work. So when I made, when I finally sort of installed it in my studio and I came in one morning and the sunlight was coming in and, and I sort of looked at this wall and there was a door and there was a, a doorknob sort of turned inside out. There was a, a keyhole and a wall sort of back to front. And I, and I just thought, a light switch that was back to front. And I just thought, I'm the wall. You know, I am the wall. That's what I've done. I am the wall. And that was the key moment for me where I really felt that there was sort of infinite possibilities of being an artist who was a wall, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> um, to keep this short, let me ask two more questions before I open to the audience. Um, maybe Anne, you can um, tell me something. We, we already taught, uh, t talked about, or you already talked about the uh, house pro project in London and um, that there were, was <coughs> a heated public debate on it. And I, um, it was for reasons of the city d development, or you can also say gentrification, that uh, these Victorian houses have been demolished in 1993. Um, how is this um, excitement or the public debate um, related to the monument or related to this development in this in the city center yeah I mean I, I think probably I would be correct in saying that the explanation for why house um, as a an original terraced house was demolished has been a bit misunderstood and it's it wasn't really necessary it wasn't really for gentrification it was for a kind of yeah no, the, the environment not the peace yeah the environment was yeah. Me being cleared to make a an idea of a park that should run from one part of East London to another, and it, you know it never it failed. That park never really ran from one end to the other, and those houses were perfectly good Victorian houses that survived all over London, and there was no really no reason for them to have been torn down to make that park. Um, you know, it, it's a part of East London that we at the time both lived in, um, and they were just very archetypal houses. They weren't, yeah, some parts of East London were very badly bombed in the war. There are some houses that were demolished and had to be torn down afterwards. But these, that was not the case with these. They, th there was um, a council who decided that it would be a very wonderful idea to have a strip of green land running through one bit of London. It was to do with um, Margaret Thatcher's Britain, really, and, and the way in which that she was thinking about how things should be developed. And, it, you know, this, this really sort of capitalistic way of um, Canary Wharf and the, and the area of London which, which was developed at that time. Um, and it was making a sort of green corridor going up to there to the financial district. And, um, uh, you know, to do with gentrification and everything, but it was also, to, it was to do with a, a sort of urban development in a way that, that um, you know, every city has. And, you know, it, but it was, it was a very sort of closed down version of things. Um, so it was part of that argument, really. Um, uh, but, the, you know, it was also this sort of, you know, as was known as the sort of liberal elite were, were, were wanting, was wanting this thing to happen. Um, and, you know, the way in which public art is now in the UK 
and I think everywhere it's very different and it's everywhere and you can't you walk down the street without tripping over a, another bit of public art you know but it, at the time it, that wasn't really happening it, you know there were monuments and there were things being put up and you know London is completely littered with bronze monuments but you know it was it, and it was the sort of biggest art controversy really in London um, since uh, the Tate bought Carl Andre's bricks, which I'm sure people know the, who the artist Carl Andre is, but he's an American minimalist and would would place bricks on the ground. And the Tate bought some in the 70s, and you know there's a complete outrage that they did that because why would you spend public money on a pile of bricks? So it was that sort of argument. Um, so it was very sort of basic, um, but more complicated because it was very politically. Um, Ensued. So, yeah, you know, it was a very, a very interesting debate and one that, you know, should continue, um, you know, about art and where art should be and it shouldn't be everywhere, quite frankly. <laughs> but it's quite hard to imagine now where London is a city that's known to embrace contemporary art and um, masses of contemporary art galleries. That wasn't the case then at all anything that had smacked of contemporary art was viewed with great suspicion and was ridiculed, really. Mm. And House was the subject of a lot of cartoons, um, like this crazy piece of art. Art. <laughs> Would, uh, in, in our days, now help the, uh, to win the Turner Press to... Uh, when the same would happen now, and the artist who casted the house won the Turner Prize. Would this change? Would this change anything in the in our times now, compared to those well, days? Well, now it's commonplace Every for there to be art yeah. all over London. It's everything. You know, it's much more diluted now. I'd say mm. so. Then it was it, the whole thing was a much sort of more extreme, sort of tougher experience. I suppose now just things are you know, yeah, more diluted. The Turner Prize has been going for decades. Everyone completely accepts it. In those days, it was still rather shocking and that it should coincide with this very shocking public sculpture was very, very newsworthy. I try and hypothesis the more um, revolt there is against the work in public space, the better the piece of art is. What, <laughs> how do you think about it? I tend to agree personally, <laughs> but, <laughs> but uh, you could um, one could say Jeff Koons in Paris. It's uh, totally different. <laughs> no, okay. So last, <laughs> <laughs> no comment. Sorry. No comment. Um, last question uh, to you, uh, Rachel. Um, you're mentioning mentioning in your catalog essay that. Um, you grew up with parents that are very political and your your mother has been an artist and she was a very feminist person. Um, what is her influence in, in your work? Where, is, um, where can you um, recognize her influence? Uh, I think in her tenacity, for sure. So her, her, her um, you know, the way in which she worked you know, I'm, I'm extremely fortunate. You know, I've made a great living out of my work. I'm so fortunate to be able to do a job that I love and, um, uh, you know, I couldn't be luckier, you know. Uh, and from my mother's generation, you know, they were the ones that really fought to make people like me be able to do what we can do now. Because when she... You know, she was a, an artist. She never made any money from her work whatsoever. You know, she was very talented. Um, but things were very different. And, you know, I think she, she, she had recognition and she did some very interesting shows and was involved with a sort of feminist um, sort of art movement in, in London. And, um, you know, for someone who was raising three kids and you know they had my parents had no money really my father was a lecturer but they had one income between a family of five um, you know she did an extraordinary job to be able to do what she did and so I will always really admire her for that and um, 
and thank her and her contemporaries for, you know, for letting my generation do what we do. Thank you. Uh, I'm sure that there are a lot of questions in the audience, and um, um, I don't know if it's my mic or... Uh, so, please. <laughs> Thank you for that presentation and talk. Um, I have a question about, um, because it, we were talking about the toughness of your work, but I feel, especially in these everyday objects and in this reversing and turning the inside out, there's also this notion of humor. And um, yeah, I was wondering if you could say something about that or how, this, how you would consider this playing into your work. Yeah, no, I, I'm very fond of humor, actually. And um, interestingly, enough, when I was a, a student, the thing that I used to go and see more than anything, more than exhibitions, was stand-up comedians. And, um, and I think there's something, there's, a, there's something about comedians and the way in which comedians perform and what they do, that they can be political, they can be performative, they can be, you know, they're, they're, they're what, often what they do is like a poem or you know, the way in which something is delivered. And, uh, yeah, and I have, I like to think, quite a good sense of humour. And, um, yeah, I, I, it is something that I play with. Not, not um, you know, I don't want to make laugh out loud work, but I like to have a sort of a gentle smile. <laughs> Somewhere over there. Thanks for the talk. I feel I should probably know this, but I don't. And it's quite a trivial question, I guess. But I wonder how the technicality of it all works. How do you fill a house and tear <laughs> it down? <laughs> um, well, it, it, it's all done with, you know, engineering and materials, really. Um, uh, we know with something like house, um, I think Anne's going to find. So, Ghost, yeah. So this is so with ghost. So this is me making ghost all those years ago, and it really things haven't changed. That's essentially what I do still, whether it's on a very large scale or not. Um, and now I have to work with engineers and people that um, make sure that things don't fall down and they have health and safety attached to them and whatever. Uh, but you know that it's essentially the same thing. It's about sort of covering a wall, or uh, a very good way of describing it actually was um, uh, if you think about a matchbox and you open up a matchbox, you take the matches out, you fill it with plaster and you close the matchbox and then you wait and then you just pull the material off the matchbox and then you have this little tiny perfect interior of a matchbox. So something as sort of as small as that is basically the same principle with everything else I make, but you know, if you're doing a building, you have to make foundations, you have to use metalwork, you have to use all sorts of things. You spray concrete, you you know, it's very complicated. So there's a lot of it is engineering and the processes that are used for sort of building roads or motorways or you know. And in the case of the Holocaust Memorial, was there a particular particular library that you that you used as a cast? Or no, no, I, I used, I, it, it was a sort of invented building, so I, it was about the idea of a, of a room in one of the surrounding houses, um, and then the books were cast from um, books that I made in order to make this very sort of uniformed, um, so it's not like the library that you're standing in front of now where there's this incredibly sort of detailed thing. If you go and look at it, it's really quite uniform and that was very intentional. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, you know, I'm much older than the uh, majority of audience here, then maybe I have different perspective. You know, I think about when I think about my life, I think that, you know, the most important in it is love, art, and beauty. 
you know, I don't want to ask you about love. Yeah, you mentioned the love when you were a child. <laughs> love. Uh, and, and, you know, uh, love to my wife, to children, to beautiful city of Vienna. I'm not from Vienna, I'm from Warsaw, but I'm living here. It is really beautiful. You will see, it's really beautiful city. Oh, I know, it's a very beautiful city. Yeah, yes. so we agree with <laughs> this at the beginning. And my question is, uh, you know, um, when uh, traditional art finished at the beginning of the 20th century, yeah, when uh, started with Malevich, with Duchamp, his, his Fontaine, yeah, uh, they started to look for new ways, yeah, new definition of art. And I would like to ask you as a famous artist, what is your definition of art and the beauty? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I might have to get back to you on that. <laughs> um, well, I... Oh, that's really... That's a very good easy question. Easy question. <laughs> it's not an easy question. It's a very difficult question. Um, I like to think that I've developed a language and a language of sort of interiors. And... Um, and I suppose that uh, that's my idea and whether it's the interior of, you know, the mind or the body or the, the, the places in which we inhabit. And, um, and with that language, I've tried to create things that are beautiful and poetic and um, sometimes ugly, you know, and sometimes very tough. And I would say that all of those artists that you've just mentioned do a very similar thing. And, um, you know, and I think that that's, you know, a very important way of, of trying to think of the world, of, of just re... You know, I think what good artists do is that they, they make you look at the familiar again and again and again and again. And, um, and, uh, and by doing that, that's how you can really understand the world in which we live. Thank you very much. I know that the gustibus non distuptandum est, yeah, but you give a very, very good answer. Many thanks. Fragen? Other questions? You can deutlich aufzeigen, wenn. Sorry, just a minute. First of all, thank you for being here. Um, I just wanted to say, um, ask a question about probably your smaller works, but consequently also your larger works. Um, common objects have been reproduced by artists for ages, but I find that with your work, although they're acutely experienced, they're not so much commercialized compared to, say, Warhol's soup cans. Um, was this always your intent, or was this just a result of the process? Um, I think, uh, you know, a little bit of both, really. Um, you know, what Warhol did was a very different thing. You know, the way he worked and his, his philosophy was, is very different to mine. Um, and I do like to work with things and, as I said before, serialise them and think about, you know, the, the, the repetition of things. Um, but, uh, yeah, I don't... Yeah, I, I mean, I liked, yeah, just by using the sort of colour and the materials and that's the stuff that informs the thing that I do next, not to do with the sort of production, if that makes sense. If that answers. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think one feature of your work that perhaps we haven't talked on about this evening is that your, the, the influence of your public projects on your wider, the wider range of your work that very often it's it's a public project and what you had to research to make it, both in terms of materials and also in terms of the content of the work and the philosophy of the work, that is what produces other, perhaps smaller, more gallery-based works, but they wouldn't exist without the thought process that's gone yeah. into the major work. Exa exactly, I mean, that, that's very well put. I think, you know, everything, as I think I tried to sort of with the writings that I um, read out, you know, everything that I do is connected. And, um, you know, 
it, you know, there's never one process or one thing that doesn't lead to another thing. It's all part of the same lineage or family tree. Yeah. Are there some more questions? Oh, yes. Hi, good evening. My name is Francesco. I work here in Vienna at the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, in particular on the side of human rights. And uh, I would be interested to know your thoughts about the role that art, and particularly public art, can have in these, I would say, troubled times that we face, particularly with uh, increasingly shrinking civil space and uh, sort of polarization. And to bring in the question on a more personal level, also your role as a woman, as a mother, as an artist in this specific <laughs> time. I, I carry on on the, on, the on the wavelength of previous questions. Let's put it in this way. <laughs> Thanks. Um, <laughs> it's uh, wow. Um, Let's fill a book. Yeah. Uh, well, I think art can have a very um, significant uh, political role. Um, but I don't think it is its role. Um, I think its role is to do something else. But these other things can come into it. The same with good literature, good poetry, good music, good, you know, whatever. Um, and, um, yeah, we live in very, very troubled times. And uh, I don't try to begin to, to try and work to resolve anything that's happen, uh, happening. I may be able to comment on things that have happened um, and I'm prepared to do that with my language. Um, but, uh, you know, I think some artists can do it and can do it very well. Um, but I also think it's, it's, it's quite a, can be quite a sort of dangerous thing. And I, and I also think it can be done very badly. And I think when it's done very badly, it's very um, offensive, actually. And uh, so I try not to do that. Can I just comment that uh, well, I think what you do very importantly in our times is to, almost in every piece, to bring us back to the human. And if, if, that, if we can be brought back to the human, Whatever's going on, that's got to be useful. Very warm applause to Rachel and Anne.